Currently, many cities across America are battling to get bike lanes right. As growing cities struggle to curb traffic and car emissions, the bike seems to be the obvious and cost-effective solution. But poor design is costing many cities, not just with redundant infrastructure, but with accidents and lives. For many cities, it's their first time building bike lanes, and as a result, they lack the standards to do it well. They're also battling communities, as some neighbors oppose any change in their town. And they're fighting culture, as many Americans were sold on the idea that the car was the ultimate symbol of freedom. Our American dream. Yet one city, or should I say region, has done an exceptional job of building out not just bike lanes, but a fantastic bike network. But it wasn't easy, and the region faced a lot of backlash. And today I'm going to show you how the Boston metro area went from streets having useless parallel white paint to a real bike network, and how Boston's politicians succeeded over local opposition. Hey, so the last week was pretty special for the team here. We saw a lot of support and good growth across our social media platforms. As always, I wanted to say thank you, as the success of this channel heavily relies on the support and engagement of all of you. We have a lot of big plans and small plans to explore how cities got to where they are, what they're doing now, and where they need to be going. So if you want to keep walking with me through big stories and small, I recommend subscribing. And if you fancy the episode, remember to drop a like. All right. Let's get back to Boston. Our story starts in 2010, when Mayor Menino, the mayor of Boston at the time, made the bold and ambitious statement, the car is no longer king in Boston, the mayor said. While he was just starting to roll out some of the first bike share programs in Boston, he had big plans in mind. Mayor Menino would continue to walk the walk into 2013, when he released a 30-year plan to develop a well-connected and extensive bike network in Boston. At the time, the city only had 120 miles of bike lanes, but their plan was to get it up to 350 miles in the next 30 years. But it wasn't just about miles, and the Boston government recognized this early. They knew the network itself had to be good. And the mayor made it a goal to make sure that these bike networks hit important destinations such as workplaces, schools, parks, and public transportation. The network also aimed to cover all of Boston, not just the downtown area as many cities tend to do. The city outlined some decent bike infrastructure. Most of it was still just white paint and plastic bollards, but it would get so, so much better. But we'll get back to that in a bit. There is actually an important detail that makes building a good bike network in Boston hard. Most of Boston is not in Boston. What do I mean by that? Most people that work in Boston or along the Charles River don't actually live in Boston proper. Thanks to a little thing called suburban sprawl and white flight, more than 85% of the Boston metro area doesn't actually live in Boston City. What makes this problematic when building out a bike network is that these other cities have their own government and Boston City cannot tell these governments what to do. Furthermore, two of the main cities that Boston neighbors, Cambridge and Somerville, only connect over a bridge. So there aren't too many options for a bike network path, but both of these cities would really step up. Across the Charles River is Cambridge. Cambridge is a college city. In fact, it might be the college city, as it has both MIT and Harvard in it. This subsequently means that the area has an enormous student population. The area also has a relatively low population density. And as a result of having a lot of room, a lot of students who do not possess a car, the city was well prepared to develop its own bike network. And in 2015, the city of Cambridge did develop a bike network plan. The city published probably the most comprehensive bike network plan I have seen in America. Nine chapters, nine whole chapters detailing their plan for the network was released to the public. They covered the aims and motivations for bike infrastructure. They generated several data-driven goals, isolating the areas where bikes were most prone to be hit by cars. And they outlined a city-wide network. And remember how I said that Boston listed some decent bike infrastructure plans? Well, Cambridge went all out. The city outlined different characteristics for bike lanes, such as the type of separation, whether it should be sidewalk level or road level, how to deal with intersections, 
and whether the bike lane should be one way or two way. I visited Cambridge a few weeks ago and got to see some of the progress firsthand. Most of the implemented infrastructure is still fairly simple, mainly paint with either parking or bollard protected bike lanes. The city does have a few sidewalk level bike lanes around new developments. Other cities were more hesitant to expand bike infrastructure. Somerville, which borders Cambridge and Boston, was not as eager to develop a regional bike plan. But in Boston, mayor after mayor would reaffirm their commitment to developing bike infrastructure. In 2019, Mayor Walsh announced that the city would need to reduce car usage by half if it were to hit its 2030 goals. And in 2022, Mayor Wu would reaffirm her commitment to bike infrastructure by announcing more bike lane expansion and more rental bike stations. Finally, other suburbs would start to come around. Somerville started incremental Vision Zero and bike lane improvements in 2020, leading up to a comprehensive bike network plan being published in 2023. While it was nowhere near as comprehensive as Cambridge's, in many ways, Somerville's bike lanes actually went up Cambridge's. Somerville's protected lanes went way beyond plastic bollards, with the majority of Somerville Avenue actually implementing sidewalk level bike lanes or curb protected bike lanes. These sidewalk level bike lanes are brilliant as the curbs prevent cars or mopeds from just leaving the road whenever they want. The dividing pattern also uses natural materials so they don't remove from the regional aesthetics the way plastic bollards do. But probably even more importantly, Somerville would develop on its community path, turning it into an excellent bike greenway that connected the exurbs in Arlington to the city core in Boston. And this route would become super important in the present day, but we'll get back to that. Today, many of Boston's bike lanes are impressive and feel incredibly safe. And while they look great now, their construction was truly an uphill battle. On this channel, I've shown repeatedly opposition to bike lanes, better transit, and safer streets in America. Boston was no different. When the city of Cambridge started entertaining the bike network, a group of neighbors organized Save Mass Ave in opposition to a bike network planned on Massachusetts Avenue. In Malden, another city outside of Boston, groups fought to oppose bike lanes and bus lanes. The group was called Keep Malden Moving with the slogan, put a brakes on bikes and bus lanes. Wait, what? No, it can't be. In Somerville, another group was formed called Keep Somerville Moving, also with the slogan, put a brakes on bikes and bus lanes. Okay, y'all, that can't be, that can't be a coincidence. For those of you who have watched this channel, you know I did an episode on these guys before. And town hall meetings were set up, all expressing the same message. Keep McGinnis moving. Okay, y'all, who, Who's writing your playbook? Exxon, Shell, you can tell me, I won't be mad. In West Roxbury, another group formed opposing a bike lane and road diet along Center Street. Honestly, it's the same story every single time. They're scared of losing parking and business. And it's the same results every time. Either the businesses aren't impacted or they actually benefit. And at most they lose like, I don't know, two or three parking spots. People are honestly so unoriginal. If you wanna see my case studies where I talk about this some more, I'll leave two videos in the description below. Okay, so there was this opposition yet the region still got its bike network. How did the elected politicians succeed? Simple, they didn't cave. A lot of these politicians ran on a promise. They promised that they would build this bike infrastructure. So they have to assume that their constituents who voted for them support this promise. And as politicians with a constitution, they didn't feel the need to pander to a few people that attend community board meetings. In most of the cases, the councils did hold a vote to decide whether they should put a pause on the bike network expansion. But in the case of Mass Ave and Malden, each time the city council stuck to their promise and voted against pausing the effort. Boston and some of the cities around it now have a good and sprawling bike network. It's allowed for more economical and sustainable traveling. It's also assisted with the proliferation of e-bikes, which tend to be more cost-effective, cleaner, and healthier than driving a cumbersome car. And, more comfortable than riding a standard bike. The bike infrastructure has also been vital to adding redundancy to the region's transportation network. Remember that bike greenway I mentioned in Somerville? Well, earlier this year, when the MBTA red line slowed down due to maintenance, commuting by bike on this greenway became actually faster than taking the train. This is healthy for the overall region's traffic, as people now have options of how to get around. Does the bike network have room for improvement? Of course. The network arguably suffers from the same thing that the train network in the region suffers from. Most of the routes are centered around getting to downtown Boston. For example, while I was in the area, I wanted to bike from Arlington to West Roxbury, but most of the suggested routes recommended I go directly into Boston. 
But the region's network is a fantastic start, and the cities around only have further plans to expand them. Hey, I just wanted to say thanks again for watching the episode. As I mentioned, we have some small and big plans for future episodes. And if you're a fan of our work, there are some small and big ways you can help out. As always, liking and subscribing helps us greatly. But also sharing the episode helps us grow the channel and spread awareness about the great urban stories happening across the country. If you really like our work, you can support us in a big way by hitting the super like button down below. We're looking to get certain gear for future episodes and that financial support would help with those plans. All right, thanks again. And until next time, remember to keep on walking or biking. <laughs>